Hello and welcome to Unit 1 or Lecture 1 where we're going to talk about our first and second line of defense. Our first line of defense is all those natural barriers that prevent us from getting uh, colonized with the pathogen and our second line of defense is phagocytosis and inflammation. So before we get too carried away here, we do need to have some terms. Uh, we need to familiarize you with a few terms. So immunology is the study of systems responsible for the disposal of foreign material. And that's foreign material that the body feels is non-self. Okay, It's the interaction of body components to fight disease or infection. It's defense against things that are considered non-self. And then serology is basically the laboratory or testing component of immunology. This is also referred to sometimes as immunochemistry. It's the study of diagnostic procedures connected with resistance and immunity. It's antigen and antibody reactions that are noted in vitro. So this is the lab testing part. Typically we're looking for antibodies in patient serum. So let's go ahead and talk about the components of the body that are considered our natural barriers preventing us from getting sick. And this would be part of our first line of defense. And some of the body's natural barriers that we're going to talk about today would be components of intact skin, components of the mouth, components of the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, the vagina, and the urinary tract. So there are properties of the skin that deter pathogen colonization, and those would be sweat, lysozyme, fatty acids, sloughing off of the epithelial cells, and sebum, and we're going to talk about all of those. So sweat is on your skin, and sweat contains lactic acid, and that keeps the skin slightly acidic, and most microbes don't like a slightly acidic environment. Then we have lysozyme. Lysozyme is a chemical that actually destroys the, the cell walls of gram-positive organisms, and lysozyme can be found on the skin. Then we have fatty acids, and those come from omega-3s in your diet. Those fatty acids are found in things like flax oil, uh, fish, and things like that, and those fatty acids are also antimicrobial. It's fatty acids in your diet that prevents your skin from cracking and um, getting an infection through those cracks. Okay. We also have sloughing off of the epithelial cells. So your epithelial cells are constantly being shed from your epidermis and bacteria sticks to those cells and they are disposed of when your epithelial cells slough off. And then finally we have sebum. Sebum is a chemical secreted by the sapacious gland. Um, it's an oil and this oil is antimicrobial in nature. So all of those things related to intact skin prevent us from getting an infection. So let's talk about the properties of the mouth that are also antimicrobial. We have mucous membranes, saliva, the acidic pH of the mouth, shedding of epithelial cells, macrophage phagocytosis, and normal flora of the mouth and upper respiratory tract. So mucous membranes, they prevent a person from being colonized with pathogens because bacteria will stick to healthy membranes and then they become trapped in those membranes. Okay. If you have vitamin A in your diet, it's really good for your mucous membranes so your mucous membranes don't dry out. Then we have saliva, and there's a chemical in saliva known as lysozyme, and I mentioned in the last slide, that's a chemical that destroys gram-positive uh, cell wall organisms, or gram-positive cell walls. And then we have acidic pH, the mouth is slightly acidic, and bacteria don't like an acidic environment. We have the shedding of epithelial cells, so bacteria, they're trapped in your mouth epithelial cells, and then they are either coughed out or swallowed. We have macrophage phagocytosis that occurs in the mouth, and then finally we have normal flora of the mouth, and that's the normal organisms that compete with pathogens for nutrients and minerals. This brings us to the properties of the respiratory tract that prevent us from getting sick. We have the movement of mucus, sneezing and coughing. By sneezing and coughing, you're actually expelling bacteria and viral particles. We have nasal hairs, and nasal hairs filters the air that we breathe from pathogens. We have closing of the epiglottis when we swallow, and that keeps gastrointestinal organisms from getting into the respiratory tract. We have mucous membranes, and we already talked about how mucous membranes have lysozyme. Your mucous membranes also have IgA, which is a type of antibody.
And then we have normal upper respiratory flora. And again, normal upper respiratory flora are the organisms that live in the mouth and, and in the upper respiratory tract that compete with pathogens. This brings us to the gastrointestinal tract and there are a number of ways that we can prevent colonization with pathogens in the gastrointestinal tract. For one, the stomach is very, very highly acidic. The stomach has a pH of about 1.0 and there's not many organisms that can actually survive that. There are only a few and those would be Shigella and also E. coli 0157H7. Most organisms that are pathogens get to our, to our lower gastrointestinal tract um, because they're entrapped in some sort of food particle. That's how they survive the acidity of the stomach. The small intestine contains enzymes and macrophages. Um, one such enzyme would be peptidase. The gastrointestinal tract contains normal intestinal flora, and that's in the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, not so much in the stomach though, because like I said, not many organisms can survive the stomach. And then we have constant motility of the small intestine. And if you remember from a physiology class, that's called peristalsis. The vagina has a slightly acid pH under normal conditions, and that is because of hormones um, like estrogen and also because of the organism known as lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is normal vaginal flora that produces lactic acid. And again, most pathogens can't survive the acidic pH of the vagina. When that pH starts to increase and becomes more alkaline, that's when vaginal infections like yeast infections and trichomoniasis start to occur. Now, urine itself is sterile. There shouldn't be any organisms in the urine unless you have a urinary tract infection. And one way that you can get a urinary tract infection is because um, the urinary tract becomes very alkaline. So the acidity of the urinary tract or of urine prevents us from being colonized with pathogens. Um, a normal pH for urine is usually 5.0 to about 6.5. Anything above that will start to make a person prone to urinary tract infections. And then finally, one other property of the urinary tract that prevents us from getting pathogens is the mechanical washing effect. So every time a person voids, they're actually preventing organisms from getting into the urethra. Now here I want to talk about some other natural barriers. They're not necessarily body systems, but they are things that prevent us from getting disease. They are things that are part of our first line of defense. We have our tears. And our tears contain lysozyme and secretory IgA, which is an antibody. Then there's body temperature. Most organisms don't like a temperature that is greater than 35 to 37 degrees, and they don't like temperatures that are below 35 to 37 degrees. We have oxygen tension. For example, anaerobes don't like to live where oxygen is present, and aerobes don't like to live where oxygen is not present. Our age affects our immune system. Cortisone, which is an adrenal hormone that, that decreases inflammation, uh, that will, it, that will um, lower our, our chances of getting colonized with pathogens. Then we have earwax, which protects our auditory canals of the ears. We have interferon, which is a chemical released by the granules of white cells, and it inhibits viral replication. That's where the name comes from, interferes. So it interferes with viral replication. And then finally, the last one on the list is serum bacteriosin. And this is a protein produced by some bacteria that's actually lethal to other bacteria. Other factors associated with immunological diseases or things that can affect your, your um, risk of getting a disease would be things like diet, metabolism, toxins or allergic reactions, stress, hormones, and nutrient levels. These all play a role in your immune system. Let's start by talking about the diet. So your diet, it's not only important in the growth and development, it is also important immunologically. Okay, your phagocytosis response and your humoral immunity is directly affected by diet. Okay, if you have a protein deficiency, your phagocytes are not as effective. If you have carbohydrate levels that are out of whack, it increases your disease risk. For example, if you're a diabetic, you have high glucose in your diet. That makes you more predisposed to getting an infection. 
If you have lipid levels that are decreased, for instance, you have low omega-3s in your diet, that makes you more susceptible to diseases. And then finally, the vitamins and minerals in your diet will affect your immune system as well. Um, vitamin A deficiency affects your skin integrity. A vitamin C deficiency makes you more prone to bacterial infections. Low folic acid in your diet affects your T-cell counts. And finally, low amounts of B1 in your diet will affect your phagocytic response. Metabolism is the sum of all things physical and chemical that are happening at any given time in the body. If the body has an inability to degrade or synthesize intermediate metabolites of a nutrient, the nutrient will be unavailable for use by the body, and that's going to affect your immune system. Some things are actually toxic to the body and other substances makes a person have an allergic reaction. This will affect your immune system. So some things on the list would be nitrates, nitrites, and dyes. Nitrates are a type of salt when broken down to nitrites will dilate your blood vessels and will lower your blood pressure. Certain additives in food that are, will become toxic to the body or a person may have an allergic response to them. And then chemicals produced during the food processing or cooking can actually lower a person's immune system as well. You can uh, be exposed to toxins that way or you could have an allergic reaction to something. Hormones play a, a large role in your immune system. Okay, the production of hormones can be affected by stress. If you have a lack of sleep, your stress hormones are going to increase. If you have a lack of sleep and your stress hormones are increased, that's going to lower your T cell counts and your natural killer cell counts. A hormone imbalance can contribute to a person's resistance to disease. So normal flora competes with pathogens so you don't become infected with, with a pathogen. Normal flora is good. These are microbes that compete with pathogens for nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Okay. Now the fetus is in a sterile environment until birth. A baby should have no normal flora until they've been born. Okay. Now after they've been born, they are introduced to organisms pretty much immediately in the first few days of their life. And that normal flora that they develop should remain relatively stable for a lifetime. And that's, of course, unless it's affected by antimicrobials, okay? Now, normal flora exists in many body sites, including the upper respiratory tract, the gut, the skin, and the genital tract. All right, so in summary, for a disease state to develop, a microorganism must be able to evade, overcome, or inhibit the body's defense mechanisms that are normally operational. The first line of defense preventing disease are the components of the skin, respiratory tract, GI tract, and urogenital tract, and all those things that we talked about up until this point. This brings us to our second line of defense, which is inflammation and phagocytosis. Inflammation and phagocytosis is a local reaction to an injury. It's an immediate reaction involving monocytes, macrophages, and neutrophils. Phagocytosis is the ingestion and digestion of microorganisms and debris. This is all enhanced by complement, which we're going to talk about in another unit, and the antibody known as IgG. Inflammation, when inflammation happens, the objective is to localize the irritant and eradicate it and also to repair tissues. Inflammation will actually increase phagocytic activity with a series of biochemical and cellular changes. Neutrophils and monocytes are in the peripheral blood while macrophages are fixed in certain tissues. There are a number of ways that you can tell that inflammation and phagocytic uh, phagocytosis has started to proceed and that would be pain at the site of infection or injury heat at the site of injury or infection, erythema, which is basically redness that occurs at the site of injury or infection, and finally swelling or edema. All of those things indicate that the second line of defense has kicked in. When the body undergoes inflammation, that involves lots of different actions, including capillary dilation, plasma proteins start to escape from the bloodstream, and leukocyte accumula accumulation at the site of injury. There are a couple of mechanisms involved in inflammation and phagocytosis. Some of those are your cellular, 
components are your cellular mechanisms, and that's going to include things like your T lymphocytes or your T cells and your phagocytic cells, your monocytes, your macrophages, and your neutrophils. And another mechanism involved in inflammation and phagocytosis would be the humoral mechanisms, and that would be antibodies and complement. Complement actually plays a role in opsonization, which prepares the cell to be engulfed. So how exactly does the body respond to an injury? Okay, there is increased blood supply to the injured site, and this causes capillary dilation. There's increased capillary permeability. There is the migration of white cells from capillaries to the surrounding tissues. And there's the migration of macrophages. The inflammation response is actually directly proportional to increased phagocytic activity. So the more inflammation you have, the more phagocytic activity you have going on. There's a number of stages that occur during an inflammatory response. First of all, you're going to see dilation of local arterioles and capillaries, and that's going to increase your blood flow to the site of the injury. Then swelling starts to, to happen, or edema fluid starts to accumulate, and that increases plasma proteins at the site of injury. Fibrin forms a network inside of the lymphatic channels, and that limits the spread of bacteria. Chemotaxis occurs, and that's when white cells migrate towards the area of injury due to a chemical signal. Phagocytes engulf and digest bacteria, and then they lyse, and that's called apoptosis. That's basically when a white cell commits cellular suicide after doing their job. Macrophages arrive and engulf the lysed white cells and bacteria, and then inflammation is, becomes resolved. Here, your T helper cells stop emitting the stay alive signal to white cells. So here's a list of the cells that are involved in phagocytosis. That would be your polymorphonuclear neutrophils, or pus cells. Uh, that top image on the left there is a neutrophil. And then we have monocytes. And then finally, the third type of phagocytic cell is macrophages of the reticuloendothelial system. And that system is now called the mononuclear phagocytic system. And you can see a picture of the macrophage on the bottom left. The mononuclear phagocytic system is a cellular system that includes scavenger cells like monocytes and macrophages. It was previously known as the reticuloendothelial system, and its job is to remove dead and damaged cells and dispose of foreign material. Phagocytosis is the major role of the mononuclear phagocytic system. The system includes phagocytic cells in the blood, lymphoid tissues, liver, spleen, bone marrow, lungs, and other tissues. Now macrophages, they are fixed at the site of infection and they're usually named after um, the, the organ that they're associated with. They all have their, a specific name. So a histocyte or a histiocyte is a tissue macrophage. A Kupfer cell is a liver macrophage. And, a, and an alveolar cell, as you can guess, is a pulmonary macrophage. Complete phagocytosis occurs when complete destruction of the infectious agent and disease is averted or cured. Keep in mind that certain bacteria can survive phagocytosis and will actually multiply within the phagocytes. And there's a couple of examples that I can think of right off the top of my head. One would be brucella and one is mycobacterium tuberculosis. They can both actually multiply within the phagocytes. There's a number of ways that bacteria can actually resist phagocytosis. There's three ways that I want to discuss here. One is that they have a capsule um, that's glycocalyx or some sort of cellular slime. And the two examples that I can think of um, uh, right off the top of my head would be Streptococcus pneumoniae and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, even Klebsiella pneumoniae. They all seem to have capsules or extracellular slime. Then we have some bacteria that have a VI antigen. And this is essentially an envelope protein that some bacteria have, like Salmonella and Citrobacter. And then finally, some bacteria will produce toxic enzymes or other toxic substances, um, substances that are toxic to the phagocytes. Some toxic enzymes that I can think of would be streptokinase from strep A, streptodornase, hyaluronidase. Those are all toxic enzymes produced by streptococcus pyogenes.
Other toxic substances that I can think of would be leukocidin. Leukocidin is produced by Staphylococcus aureus. So let me give you a few examples here of how these bacteria resist phagocytosis. So strep pneumo, we already talked about that, has a capsule. Staph aureus produces leukocidin. Streptococcus group A produces a number of enzymes, one of which is streptokinase. Neisseria meningitidis, it's encapsulated. Klebsiella pneumoniae, it's encapsulated. Salmonella typhi has the VI antigen. Haemophilus influenza has a capsule. And streptococcus group B, they produce exotoxins, or in some cases, streptococcus group B has a capsule. So that's some examples of how bacteria go on to resist phagocytosis. A fever is the body's way of trying to neutralize bacterial or viral infections. A fever is usually caused by the endotoxins of gram-negative rods. These are toxins present on bacterial cell walls. Or a fever can be caused by extracts of leukocytes. So the chemicals that are being released by the granules of the white cells can affect the brain's hypothalamus. It's the body's set point for temperature um, that is increased when the brain's hypothalamus is, is affected. The purpose of a fever is to mobilize leukocytes to the area of infection or injury. The purpose of a fever is to enhance phagocytosis, diminish endotoxins of gram-negative rods, increase T-cell proliferation, and enhance activity of interferon. So there are four primary steps involved in phagocytosis, and we're going to talk about all four of those steps. The first one is called chemotaxis. The second step is called opsonization, attachment, or adherence. The third step is called engulfment. And the fourth step is called digestion and killing. Chemotaxis is the first step in phagocytosis, and it's when white cells move towards the injured site via the stimulation of chemicals. So segmented neutrophils are especially modal, and they're usually the first to arrive at the injury. Tissue macrophages are actually already there. But it is the neutrophils first that mobilize and move to the area that is infected or injured. Okay. Now there's a lot of potent uh, chemotaxins, and that, or a lot of potent initiators of chemotaxis, and that would be the chemotaxins, the leukotaxins, and components of complement. Those will all activate your white cells to move to the area of injury. The second step in phagocytosis is opsonization and attachment or adherence. So when organisms are coated with material that speeds up phagocytosis, this is known as opsonization. Phagocytes go through the endothelium and snuggle up next to the bacteria and then attach to them. An opsonin promotes attachment of phagocytes, um, and those are going to be things, some, some opsonins are FC receptors on neutrophils and C3 receptors on complement. Serum proteins also have phagocytes attached to the bacteria or virus particle. And some serum proteins that help with phagocyte attachment or that are opsonins would be CRP, complement, and antibodies. Those are all considered efficient opsonins. The third step in phagocytosis is engulfment or active membrane invagination. This is the third step in phagocytosis. Here, the phagocytic cell cytoplasm starts to flow around the engulfed cell and fuses to itself. It now becomes a phagosome. Bacteria must be more hydrophobic than the phagocyte to be engulfed. Finally, digestion and killing is going to be the fourth stage of phagocytosis, and this has to do with the intracellular event of killing and digestion. The phagocyte granules release hydrolytic enzymes like lysozyme, lactoferrin, and myeloperoxidase, and that leads to the digestion of the opposing bacteria or virus. Inside of the phagosome, lactic acid increases, um, pH becomes 4.0 or less, and that's lethal to most bacteria. Also inside the, the phagocyte, um, superoxide and hydrogen peroxide is produced, and then finally the neutrophils die and are phagocytized themselves by macrophages. 
So on this slide, this is just a nice graphic so you can see what's happening during phagocytosis. So in the first image on the top left, what we have here is chemotaxis where the cell is mobilized. It's moving to the area of infection via a chemical signal. The middle image on the top row would be opsonization and attachment. The third image on the top right is going to be engulfing of the bacteria. And the bottom left image is when our cell becomes a phagosome. Then killing and digestion occurs. Um, the waste is ejected from the cell and the neutrophil dies. And then later that dying neutrophil or dead neutrophil is going to be engulfed by macrophages. We have a number of cellular defense mechanisms that play a role in our immune system, including neutrophils, monocytes, tissue macrophages. Those are our highly phagocytic uh, cells and then we have eosinophils and basophils which aren't as highly phagocytic but will release chemicals from their granules during an immune response. Neutrophils are also known as polymorphonuclear neutrophilic leukocytes and they move from the circulating blood to the tissues in response to a chemical signal that's chemotaxis. They're granulated cells and their granules contain a number of different chemicals and enzymes. Myeloperoxidase is probably the most important one on the list. Uh, myeloperoxidase makes hypochlorous acid which is lethal to most bacteria. That's actually the chemical that makes pus green. And then other digestive enzymes that I don't want to talk about too much at length here would be acid phosphatases, neutral proteinases, lysozyme, acid hydrolases, beta galactinidase, and elastase. Monocytes are very effective phagocytic cells. They contain lipase and can destroy capsules of some bacteria like Mycobacterium tuberculosis. They migrate from the blood to tissues as macrophages and they are granulated cells and their granules contain peroxidase, acid phosphatase, aerosulfatase, and lipase. The third phagocytic cell that I want to talk about is tissue macrophages um, and they have specific names based on their particular tissue that they're associated with and we talked about those the connective tissues are the histocytes the, the liver I'm sorry connective tissue macrophages are histocytes our liver macrophages are Kupfer cells um, they are the most chemically active so they're not the most physically active as far as they don't migrate as fast as neutrophils are concerned but they are the most chemically active. The tissue macrophages play a large role in cellular immunity. They play a role in microbial killing, tumor killing, intracellular parasite killing, phagocytosis, secretion of soluble mediators or cytokines, those are chemicals secreted by cells, and antigen presentation. And we're going to talk about that in our third line of defense. The macrophage will actually phagocytize pathogens, migrate through the lymphatic system, interact with T cells, which interact with B cells, making antibody in our third line of defense. Our eosinophils are not very efficient at phagocytic activities, but they are increased in allergic reactions and also parasitic infections. They're very effective against parasites due to the cationic proteins in their granules once those granules have released that chemical. Basophils, they are not efficient at phagocytic activities either. They mostly play a role in hypersensitivity reactions. They do have granules present and their granules contain heparin and histamine. These are the two systems of cells and cellular activity that contribute to disease prevention and phagocytosis. System one is the mononuclear phagocytic system. Um, essentially, this is monocytes and macrophages. And system two is the myeloid cell system, which is essentially the granulocytes, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the basophils. All right, now for the fun stuff, we get to talk about some of the deficiencies of the phagocytic system that, that lead to di different diseases. We have uh, CG CGD disease, Shidea Kagashi disease, Job syndrome, G6PD deficiency, myeloperoxidase deficiency, lazy leukocyte syndrome, and chemotactic factor inhibitor disease. And we're going to talk about all of these. 
Chronic granulomaceous disease is the result of a congenital condition, including an inability to produce hydrogen peroxide in white cells. It's a hereditary disease, mostly found in infant males, and it's usually deadly by the age of seven. People that have this disease have repeat infections of enterics, staphylococcus, and yeast. The organisms are actually engulfed, but not killed due to a lack of hydrogen peroxide in their cells. T and B cells and complement function is all normal, but they do form granulomas from macrophages surrounding the sites or macrophages surrounding sites of infection. This brings us to Shidiak Higashi disease. This is an essential, this is essentially a disorder of neutrophils. It's hereditary, it's fatal by the age of six. People that have this disease have frequent skin infections and they have little pigment in their skin or eyes. This condition also causes albinoism in cats. Patients um, are very photosensitive and that makes sense because they have very little pigment in their eyes. And then they have large granules in the cytoplasm of their leukocytes that are very apparent. They can be seen in the leukocytes on a peripheral blood smear. This brings us to Job syndrome, which is a defect in phagocytosis disease. Um, people that have Job syndrome, they have skin and subcutaneous abscesses. Usually that is from Staphylococcus aureus. They have very little inflammatory response and their phagocytes are unable to kill bacteria. G6PD deficiency is when we have um, a lack of this enzyme, so H2O2 is not generated. So bacteria, they are engulfed, but they're not killed. And there's many sources of infection associated with this deficiency, including E. coli infections, staphylococcus infections, and serratia infections. In myeloperoxidase deficiency, people are actually lacking this enzyme in the granules of their neutrophils. Patients are prone to infection since all the other enzymes in the granules have to take up the slack. Um, these people are especially prone to fungal infections. In lazy leukocyte syndrome, the neutrophils are unable to reach the site of infection. They have a defective chemotactic response. Patients that have lazy leukocyte syndrome have repeat bouts of bacterial infections and severe neutropenia. Chemotactic factor inhibitor disease is the last one that I want to talk about. Uh, patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma or lupus have increased chemotactic factor inhibitor, so it inhibits the, the um, neutrophils from moving to the site that is affected um, with an infection or inflammation. Okay, so there's a number of assays that an immunologist might order to determine if a person has a deficiency of their phagocytic function. They could order chemotaxic assays, ingestion assays, or killing assays. Okay, so in a chemotaxic assay, we are determining um, if, our, if our neutrophils are able to migrate to the area that is infected. So we're looking at patient neutrophils and normal neutrophils, and we're taking an auger plate and we're adding complement component 3A. If our neutrophils don't migrate towards C3A, then they are having a chemotactic assay problem or, or they're having a chemotaxis problem. Okay. Another immunologist order test could be ingestion assays where we're looking for the ability to ingest bacteria. Here we make one to 10 dilutions of neutrophils to bacteria and then we make a smear after 30 minutes at body temperature and we look at 100 cells and we're looking for the number of cells ingested per cell. And then finally an immunologist might order a killing assay which measures bacterial killing by neutrophils. We can take Staphylococcus aureus and patient serum that has the phagocytes in there and combine white cells and bacteria, then view to see how many bacteria are actually intracellular. Okay, so we can do that by staining a smear with right stain, looking at how many bacteria um, have been ingested by the cell, and count uh, that count indicates the degree of bacterial killing. So those are the three tests that an immunologist might order to see if a person has a phagocytic function problem. So that brings us to the end of lecture one. Uh, stay tuned for lecture two or unit two where we talk about antigens, antibodies, and vaccines. Bum, bum, bum.